this is really good because it's it's going to be a little random, but I'm going to explain how I fell into doing my first book, which was Sex Objects. At the time, I was a commercial photographer on the low end of the pole. I would get $200 a day somewhere in the United States and be flown from where I lived, which was New York City, and shoot an industrial film strip. And at night, I had un I have unending energy now, but back then I had all unending energy plus. And so I uh, would, like, for example, end up in Raleigh, South Carolina, or North Carolina, wherever it is. And everybody else, we would shoot all day. It was a full day from like 9 a.m. to 6 o'clock when the factory would close. Let's say it was the furniture factory in North Carolina, South Carolina. And um, I would then look in the baseball sports section to see what massage parlors there were and or nude model agent, model studios. And they were all misnomer because often at a... At a, at a um, New model agency. There were no, there were no lights. I was given a limited amount of time, and I had no references. Um, I would just do her portrait. In the book, there was always a black and white image and a color image, but there was no book in mind when I started. Um, this was just sort of the kill time, and I started realizing I was starting to get something interesting. And there was a New York State Council of the Arts grant. $5,000 grant, which was a lot of money then, maybe it is today, and um, I applied for it, and um, a well-known art photographer, I saw him years later, and he says, I got you that grant, and he was on the board, and he, you know, and he gave it to me, and, and uh, that was huge, and um, so I took the, the my, I, I made a mock-up calling it sex objects and took it to light impressions which was in rochester new york and it, it was distributing books photography books and when i and there was a a convention on photography book publishing at eastman kodak house and it was in rochester and there i was with my mock-up and um i went into the offices of light impressions the distributor and I looked down, and there was a book similar to mine by Roswell Anger, the photographer. And I thought, I'm not going to publish my book. They're already doing something just similar to it. And it worked the opposite. They took one look at my mock-up and said, yeah, cool. Who do you want to publish it? And at this point already, uh, Ralph Gibson had turned it down at Luston Press. Any number of publishing houses had turned it down. And they took me the next day to the conference and walked up to Addison Berkey, who had the Addison House publishing house, small publishing her, that had done the Robert Weiss book and a number of other photography books. And they walked up to him and they said, you should publish this book. And he looked at the mock-up and said, will you distribute it? And they said, yes, we'll distribute it. And in two seconds, I had a publisher, where before I couldn't get anywhere. So that's just, you know, it works that way sometimes luck of the draw. Of course, you have to put all that energy into it. And after you've done all the energy, then you might get lucky, you know, and, and I was lucky on that one. Somewhere in the process, after having a publisher, after having shot mo most of it, having the $5,000 grant, I got a call from Berkey, Addison Berkey, say we're not publishing it because we're getting sued on this other book they did. Because one of the mothers, I guess, it, it probably also related maybe to... Um, Tulsa, or, yeah, Tulsa, where one of the mothers of one of the people in it and Larry Clark's book sued successfully, uh, Gip, uh, Ralph Gibson's publishing house. So I went to uh, Robert Cuvallo, the photography lawyer, and he went over each model release, backing it up. So I, it, went, it went through. But in my life as a photographer, I've had to save almost every project of any worth somewhere along the line, that it gets bashed or knocked down. And then instead of going, oh, fuck, I don't say, oh, fuck. I try and find some solution, and in this case, it worked. So this woman, who became a short-term lover, uh, she worked in Washington, 
D.C., and she said how uh, uh, senators and politicians were the kinkiest. And this is uh, an iconic image because she looks so innocent, and God knows there was probably some innocence. That's in Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa. And as I said, I would shoot this stuff late at night while everybody else on the team of commercial photographers the production team would be asleep in the motel, I'd be out, you know, and that's always been my way of doing stuff. This image struck a chord with Richard Prince. He ended up buying a lot of the photographs and the mock-up for sex objects. And he then later on, it was a miscommunication, but very much a Richard Prince moment where he, without really having permission, he put it on the hood of the muscle car that he had made um, and showed at Stephen Cohen Gallery years later. I have a picture of Pamela Anderson on her cell phone leaning against the muscle car with my image on it. Some of the women I knew, like the woman in Washington, I knew for a while. But this woman I only knew for like an hour. And I also remember there were no lights. None. But it was a photo studio, in quotes. I'll read what's on the back of the photograph. This is all, by the way, shot in film, obviously, in the 70s. Um, Renee works in a, quote, nude model studio located in the back of a Des Moines Iowa Dirty Bookstore. Poignant, you know? So this is in um, the Valley. I remember it because um, I got a jaywalking ticket taking my equipment. You'd have to convince these women that it was cool to let me take their picture. They had to sign a model release. They had to give an ID. And so it was costly. It didn't cost a lot of money, but it was more how difficult it was to convince these people that it was okay. And, and I promised them that whatever they were, that's what it would say in the eventual book, and it did. Though two women who were go-go dancers in the Bronx got a funky lawyer and tried to sue me because the because they because they said. It says that we're it's a, in a book of hookers. Well, that the review guy said that. I didn't say it. That's not what I said in my book. But that's the kind of thing you learn to sort of absorb. You're going to get ha hated by everybody, whether they're in the book or out of the book. But I like this picture. And, and now, many years later, after having met William Eggleston, I realized that I wasn't copying him. I wasn't aware of his work, but we were shooting with the same sort of feeling, straightforward, no, no, no facade, no, no glamorization, no nothing, just straightforward. Well, and, did you pay them what you what they would normally get for a? I did the session, and then on top of the session, I would pay for this, and it was convincing them that, you know, that I wasn't FBI, which they would assume I was. You know, that's back then. This was before 9-11. That was not the problem, the paranoia that's today. But there was paranoia that you were with the FBI, with the, you were the feds, and you were and you were accusing them of trafficking and sex. I lived on 6th Avenue in New York in the 70s. My first, I had lived in Taos, New Mexico before. I went to New York and started, I wanted to be more involved with the, anti-war movement instead of started doing this book. You know, in this case, I shot it in my studio. I took it from the street to my studio. And it had, to, it had a lot to do with silver tongue. You know, you had to explain, don't worry, this will not impact on you. You know, it's not negative. And anyway, I'm glad I did it, right? And then this is Barbara Butterfly. I did have a long relationship with her. Um, and she... When I, I met her after riding the elevator with Wolfman Jack in um, Waldorf Astoria, it was a um, New York Dolls concert or something like that. And she was in the lobby of New York 
uh, more of a story, uh, topless in black tights with her bare chest. And I go, whoa, uh, you should come back home with me. I shot this in south of, just south of LA. And yeah, usually I had very cool, high topped leather shoes that were distinctive for me and they were handmade and usually they're in the picture somewhere if I've had some relationship with the model, you know. Both uh, go-go dancers in the Bronx. One was French and one was Puerto Rican, I wanna say. But you, you can feel this heavy double weight. I printed everything. I spent many, 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 too many years in the dark room with stop baths, for example. And I knew all about trying to protect myself, but you can't protect against osmosis. And um, I'm certain that it has contributed to the mm, questionable health, my questionable health today. Margaret is her name. And she was in a nude model agency, uh, agency in Baltimore, Maryland, where I taught, uh, Antioch College had a social documentary branch school and I, that was the first teaching I ever did I taught for a dozen years school of visual arts international center of photography hunter and um yeah she she was amazing and cool yeah so uh, you you one was so exhausted trying to gain access to take the photographs that you were lucky if you had any spirit or any strength to make interesting images because you just wasted all your time getting to that point where you could take the images. Where so, was the re most remote area you found these girls? Jesus, I don't know, the Chicago airport, late at night. You know, I mean, every, they were everywhere. Everywhere I went, they were. It was pervasive. You know, American Road says sex. That was, if you read the introduc introduction, that's what it was about. But this was um, a misnomer. They weren't sex objects necessarily. It was just a way to make a living. It did have some good reception when it came out, even though Senator Marchi from Staten Island attacked it as being pornographic, which obviously it's not. But back then he wanted to get reelected, so he made a big fuss with the New York Times and AP about how could the arts councils support such pornography, which it was not. So, you know, that was way back then in, in the, in the mid-70s. Um, the New York, and yeah, that was early exposure to stupid thinking. And, um, but now uh, it was in a magazine called Camera 35 where the uh, author Edelman, Michael Edelman, I think his name was, uh, mentioned it as one of the, the documentaries of the decade, which was nice to read, nice to hear. And then um, now, it, now they're available from me and from um, Lee Kaplan at Arcana Books, which is a really fine art bookstore in Culver City. I did Sex Objects, which was American Roadside Sex, in the 70s, 76 it came out. And then around 19, in, around, in 1980, I went around the country for a year with my wife when we got married. Then I came back to New York and I started photographing artists. That included a lot of Lower East Side artists like uh, Kenny Scharf and Keith Haring and David Wanarovich. One of the pieces that I was involved with dealt with a peer that the artist David Wanarovich asked his fellow artists to contribute artwork to this space, knowing that the space would be torn down. So this is a picture of, of David Wanarovich. Um, I wanted to do his portrait. We went down to the Hudson River, and without any warning, he said, are you ready, and dropped this rather valuable piece of artwork he had made into the Hudson River, gone forever. And that was interesting. I like that whole approach because there was this whole commercial, heavy commercial interest in how to make money off of art rather than making the art. That, that was the deal. So, um, as I said, it was a pier. And so you can see the black shadows 
is the work above above the doorway is the work of Richard Hamilton, the the fine artist who died, you know, not not in obscurity, but he wasn't as well received as he is now. This is a Devo Wonorovich cow mural with a tag by Dondi, this fellow right here. When I pulled this group of images down from the shelf, I realized I had shot it 35 years earlier, the material 35 years earlier, and that's the same age as my daughter. And so I put a picture, not by me, but of someone else on the back cover of the book uh, to sort of give it time reference. These, this is a group shot of the artists in the Civilian Warfare Gallery, and this is one of um, Louise Frangella's murals. Many of them are dead, including Louise from uh, Argentina. But in, in amongst this group is Greer Langton, who you'll see more work of. You see the transgender woman right there. Many, many important artists were in that gallery. Huck Snyder's bathroom. I think he recently died, I want to say. I'm not sure about that. Rick Prohl mural and Rick Prohl in my studio. Rick Prohl by Eric Kroll. Again, David Wonorovich in the hallway. I think there's a, a Basquiat tag in this hallway. So yeah, so I obsessed on artists and artwork for many years, and whichever way, but they're all kind of important today. Everyone seems to respond to this image of the bloody ballet shoes. Okay, so that was done in the uh, early 80s. So I'm 72 years old, and I shoot all the time. And so you just saw material I did in, in the mid 70s while living in New York. Recently, NN Books off of Instagram, which is now my new format, my place I want to go with my work, um, they did a, a fanzine that I entitled Every Mother's Nightmare. And in there is some work that bridges the gap from when I moved to New York in 71 to when I did the New York artists of the 80s, New York downtown artists of the 80s. So this is the cover, which is actually an image I did in New York in my studio on Park Avenue in um, early 90s. But in this book, well, there's this image called George Bernard Shaw drank mother's milk in his coffee every morning. This child, this baby, is now 35 and getting her master's from Columbia. Uh, that's my wife feeding my coffee with breast milk. This is 1988 with Susan Smith, and the piece is called Summer Rental. And I still see her. She came to my opening in Atwater Village three weeks ago. That This is out in East Marion, Long Island. This was taken in 1969. It's the first time I can recall where I approached total strangers and asked them to take their clothes off, which is something I do often. And this was done uh, on my way to Grinnell, Iowa, from living in Taos, New Mexico. With photog I was traveling with photographer uh, William Davis and my dog, White Shepherd, named Mitru. And we were going to look at a, a new print dryer, new, a print washer. And these women were at a gas station, and I asked if they would please come to the field and take their clothes off. And here they are taking their clothes off. I'm very pleased with this shot. This woman is from a Grateful Dead concert um, uh, right after Woodstock. Watkins Glen. It's Watkins Glen. It had uh, the Allman Brothers and uh, Grateful Dead. I never got to the, anywhere near the music, but I 
did shoot there. Okay, this is a mud wrestling contest in South Dakota. And I, in 1980, after getting married to the woman who gave me the breast milk, we went on the road for a year and I took 800 rolls of black and white film of Americana. I mean, I, I'm an anthropologist, that's my background. And so the most usual is the most interesting to me. And this was in a club, very cool, very sexy. This is an interesting picture for me historically is down in Miami, it's at the 1972 Democratic Convention. And it's, they used to have these free breakfasts or whatever, we'd all go to them um, at the hotels. And this is a woman, again, I said, hey, uh, uh, can I take your picture? And it makes me think of William Eggleston, you know, just straightforward Americana. There it is. So this is a typical Eric Kroll collaboration with his wife. This is um, later. Um, I'm visiting my parents in Taos, Tucson, Arizona, and I suggested to Linka that we go down to the national park, and she'd get me hard, and we would stand there while the tourists drove by at 7 a.m. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it worked really well. It was really good. Oh, we were supposed to look like cactus. Uh, this is a uh, telephone sex box in Times Square. This is not there anymore. Uh, I think I did this. I know I did this for Der Spiegel magazine, um, which is the Time magazine of Germany. I worked steady for them the whole time I was living in New York from 71 to 90. It's the early 90s. A big slice of my life came about when Benedict Taschen, the unknown publisher, in 1993 approached me about doing a book of my work. And he had seen a picture of mine. There was, a, there was an entire issue done of a French girly magazine. And he really liked this one photograph. And he approached me, and I had just gone through a, a negative experience with foreign publishers. And I said, no, I don't want to do it. And he flew to New York with a buddy of his. And he came to the studio, and he, and I said, well, I'll do it. If, but I, didn't know, I had no idea about him. I was saying exactly the way he was. I didn't know it. I said, if you do my book in a year... I'll do it. He says, yeah. And little did I know that's how he worked. He wanted in and out as fast as he could do it. And so, um, let me see. Yeah, this is it. He saw this image of the girl on the swing, and that totally turned him on. And if you know anything about Benedict Taschen, he only does that which turns him on. And so, even though he doesn't care at all for fetish, he had the smarts to give it the title suggested and that title and this cover led to an immediate 100,000 volume sales and it went on to over a quarter million volume sales and they say if you, you go five times that number and that's the number that see the book so a million and a half a million and a quarter or something like that saw the work in this book and it put me on the map uh, when I was with my mother, my 89-year-old mother in Barcelona in the Ramblas, there was my book on the, um, on the, in the newsstands. And so he gave me the name recognition I needed, you know, in a way that was unimaginable. And, you know, the uh, cool photographs, that's Honor Noel. And for sure, Richard Kern is right here behind me. I have the shot. Yeah, right. And he's he's studying erotica th with me. And uh, yeah. And that's Susan Smith, who I showed you a minute ago as a su su summer rental, who I still see. Um, this woman is Michelle out of Detroit. I don't, I don't know whether she's in that world anymore. Uh, this woman I met at the post office. I mean, that was my life. You know, I was very... I felt very comfortable approaching a beautiful woman. And what would happen for me was 
you know, like if I visited my friends in, in Flagstaff and with a bunch of photographers, they'd say, oh, you're so lucky you're in New York. You got all these women to photograph. And I looked at the waitress and I said, are you busy tomorrow? And so she's in that book, the subsequent book from this one. So this one did really well. And Benedict said, okay, send me another book. And I had nothing. This de depreciate, de depleted all my imagery. So it took me a couple of years to build it back up, shooting in a studio like you do, Dave, right now. And he didn't like that. So he just sort of to make it clear that he was the boss, he uh, only published, only printed 70,000 copies of this book. And I didn't want boobs on the cover. I thought it would hurt the sales. I was wrong. Did fine. And he said, well, by contract, we decide the, con the, the, um, the image. But by contract, it had to include the entire transparency, including her little toe. And that was very important to me. So, uh, yeah, so, whatever. It's cool. I mean, it's, you know, it's cool. And it shows my personality. I mean, I think that sex should be hot as shit, but it can be absurd. So this woman said, I have a problem with showing my pussy or something. So I said, no problem. And we put a caution tape over her lips. And she was a stripper up in um, Flagstaff. I mean, every every image has a story. When I moved into my studio in Pacific Heights in San Francisco, I looked at the bookshelf and I thought, hmm. And so I called Dark Garden, Garden the great m makers of corsetry, and said, do you know anyone who could install a woman in the bookshelf? And they said, oh, yeah. So B Vaughn from Body, Mon Body Modification came and did it. You know, and that's a classic Kroll image, thanks to him. So, thanks to the, uh, the uh, collaboration. What did you do with the bookshelf after? Did you put it back? I had, no, I still have it. I keep it. So if I ever want to, you know, do anything, I like this image a lot. Star. There was a there was a uh, a club called Bon Jagogo every Wednesday night in San Francisco. I met her there. I mean, I go to clubs. You know, I would go to the clubs. And look for, I go still go out all the time. I was the last two nights I was at Jumbo's. I mean, that's what I do. I'm looking for talent or whatever it's called. You know, I, I'm not going to find them at my house, in my house. Um, I don't know. Um, Lou, Lucette Minx, a cover girl who danced at uh, the Mitchell Brothers. She was a scratch golfer. Very important. Anyway, so that was Tashin and Tashin. I, I in the end he um, he invited me to have my first full time job as a photo book editor for him. And I moved from San Francisco to LA. My kids were fully grown and and gone uh, to college and on to wherever life. And so I moved to LA and um, that didn't work 100%. I got fired after a while, but I was glad to, get, I'm glad that I got out. And then uh, when I got fired, I had to find a place to live that I could afford. And that was my mom gave me her house. She died and gave me her house in Tucson, which I really like now. It's very isolated. Well, not really isolated, it's isol more isolated. And it's a desert, and it's huge. And, um, like, for example, Vice Network did a piece, seven-minute piece, on the chaos in my house. And I work from chaos. I think creativity can come from chaos. So I suggest two things, chaos and Tumblr. Uh, and porn. Porn is really, for me, a very important influence. Coming here, I wanted to swap images with people, and I um, remembered some 
photographs I I own and seen of signed Helmut Newtons, there were machine prints. So I went and started making Kinko seven dollars machine prints. So this is some of that which I just brought. So this is Felice, who was my main muse for many, many, many years. And this is out a place they dump cattle for them to hang out until the they get slaughtered or something or branded. Maybe they get branded. I don't know. Anyway, she's attached to it. Felice, when we first started going together, um, about to be spanked in his father's kitchen. This is rough sex. Um, I heard it through a wall, and then I asked the couple to reproduce it again for my camera. A woman in ballet boots in the country. Peeing. This woman I discovered at San Francisco Art Institute she had braces, tattoos, piercings, and was an artist. That's about it for me. This is, I can't remember her name, maybe you remember it. Same model that um, our friend, our mutual friend Richard Kern used on a cover. Um, but that's my main male model in San Francisco, Brandon. He was in one shot after another. I want to say her name was Mona or something like that. And that's shaving cream, and he said it was really fucking cold. This is um, up on Mulholland Drive. I had saran, to, oh, saran wrapped a woman in colorful saran wrap, and um, I wanted a portrait with her. And this is at Chaz Ray Crider Studio, and um, I wanted to shoot a woman there, and so I shot this woman, and she um, asked me if I wanted to see her party trick. And I said, of course, yes. And she put her cigarette out on her tongue. It's one of my favorite pictures. It's got a uh, photograph by Helmut Newton in the background of Andy Warhol. But this is Jamie Langford receiving an enema as a nurse in my house in Silver Lake. But keep in mind that these two six-foot, big-hipped, big-breasted women came to the door of this motel, hotel in downtown San Francisco, naked. And that's how I, I was invited in. And um, I made this image called uh, Men Are Pigs. And I love collecting vintage stuff, cool stuff. That's all my clothes. I'm ridiculous about clothes. And uh, I want to make the woman look as interesting and already beautiful, but dress the woman and, in a concise way, in an interesting way. Akira, and she dances locally at Jumbo's. And yesterday I brought a see-through Asian dress for her to please dance with on stage and then give to me. And I already had seen her fabulous stockings. She's an artist and I wanted to own them. So I bought as an art piece her stockings and the worn dress. But this is down in Bisbee, Arizona, many years earlier. And uh, we're in a vintage trailer. And um, she's, as I said, she's great to collaborate with. It's, once you have someone where the energy is right, you don't want to let go of that. And hopefully they don't want to let go of it. I do a lot with Instagram. I have a, an audience that I really want to work with. And um, I had shot a, a woman, a beautiful woman, and she uh, saw a leather rabbit's head and asked if I would shoot her in it. And I did. I came When I came here this time, I shot her in it. The next day, I, I explained how I was... I had seen <clears throat> on, in, on Tumblr... A woman wearing cut off dungaree shorts and had a, a metal hook up her ass. And she was in public. And I thought, wow, that's as good as it gets. The only trick in life is to stay alive. And I'm doing pretty well at it. I'm still alive. And I'm still very active. I, I wear all the women out. And um, not in bed, outside of bed. Yeah, I'm very in, in, invigorated by creativity. It's I was raised by 
folks in the wilds of Westchester and a, and a wealthy uh, estate, kind of cool, mid-century modern place with woods so I could tie the women up and take photographs. And it was really important to me um, for my creativity to be isolated, to come up with my own ideas. I don't care for television, don't watch it. Um, it's a totally boring thing. Sometimes I go to a movie, but I'll let this be my cinema. I have a lot more images to make, and uh, a lot of my friends who I care a lot about aren't here to keep going. They're not here at all, which is too bad. But anyway, yeah, I'm always on the road. I mean, I probably do 30,000 miles a year on the road. I bet, I bet Dave goes 2,000 miles a year. That's just a different perspective. I want to see what's over that hill. That interests me.